Okay, so this week we are talking about access controls. So access controls are the things that are put in place on a computer system that restrict what people and programs are allowed to do, basically. So very, very important in terms of security. One of the most important topics, I would say, uh, in the entire computer security like curriculum. So this is particularly important and also something that I uh, that is related to research and things that, that I uh, am involved in. So there is quite a lot of terminology in this lecture, um, but it is quite important, so just um, bear with me. So as we know, the term access control can refer to physical security. So we, when, we, when there are access controls in place, it's literally you know doors and gates and all that sort of stuff that keep people out when they're not supposed to be you know, in certain areas. So when you use a badge to swipe into an area, that's an access control. Um, but what we're focused on uh, for this lecture is the digital access control side of things. And it's very analogous, like it's a very similar concept and a lot of the same theory applies that we're about to talk about. But we are, I'm particularly focusing on the computer security side of things. So digital, digital access controls are the things that restrict access to resources and the various interactions with um, you know, different programs and things on a computer. So it's all about authorization. So that's what a subject's allowed to perform. In order to do that, we need to have already done authentication. So the stuff from last week about how do you know someone is who they say they are, you need to do that first. Once you know that that person is who they say they are, now you can start to enforce access controls. So you can say, okay, yeah, so Chris come, tries to enter a room, for example, you show your badge, and I check the photos the same, so okay, you are authenticated. I, I'm convinced that you're, that you're Chris. Uh, then I might look at the list of people allowed in the room, and if your name's on that list, then you're allowed in. So that first step is um, authentication, checking who you are, uh, and then the access control is the authorization step, where we actually check what you're authorized to do. Um, and the important thing is this immediates subjects' access to objects. So a subject is just the um, person or the thing doing something. So in a computer system, it might be the program that's running. So that process is the, the subject of the access control. It's trying to do something. And when we're making access control decisions, it's what is that subject allowed to access? Is that subject allowed to access this object? And objects are just mostly static resources of so files, but also if a, um, a, you can also say an object might also be a process because if a process is trying to access another process, in that situation, the, the process that's acting, you would say is the subject and the process they're trying to connect to is the object. Um, and uh, also if you're trying to access the network, that, that might also be referred to in those terms as well. But it's all about enforcing a security policy. So we need some policies or some rules that states who's allowed to do what. Um, and then we're going to enforce that with our access controls. So we're aiming for complete mediation, which means that we really want the security to work and the program shouldn't just be able to access some other program to get the, at the files that they need to, that they want to access. Like there has to be a consistent way that the security is um, enforced. So for example, if I was a person standing at the door checking name badges, like, are you allowed in this room? If there was another door at the back of the building and no one was guarding that, that would fail the complete mediation test, right? So that, that would be a bad security design because someone would just come in through the other door. So in order to work, we need to actually have just like one way of accessing a resource and we need to um, be able to carefully define how that behaves. Um, and one of the ways that we are sure that it's going to work is by thinking about the trusted computing base. So trusted computing base, or the TCB, is basically a term that represents all of the software and hardware and all of the parts and pieces that go together to enforce the policy. So if we're talking about like a Linux or a Windows system, for example, that's basically most of the operating system. So uh, let's just say Linux, for example. The kernel, every pro process that's running on that system is root. Um, basically, um, 
whatever login programs there are and all, all those sorts of things. That's all part of the trusted computing base because if there are any vulnerabilities in any of that stuff, the security is all going to break. So that you know the security, like the kernel, is particularly important that it is enforcing security in, in the correct way. Um, so yeah, even hardware. So there's a news item, I don't know if you've heard from this week, a very clever exploit where um, basically by flipping bits um, in memory in, uh, in on a certain type of um, hardware, it's possible to basically corrupt a um, different set of memory, which can result in privilege escalation in, in Linux, basically. I mean, it's, it's, incredibly, it's incredibly clever. But um, so hardware also comes into it. Um, so all these things go together to actually enforce uh, the security. Um, if we can, if the person can basically avoid the security controls, then we're, you know, it's not good. So another example of that might be email in an organization. If you have this really clever uh, access control policy that specifies which people within an organization are allowed to access certain files, say it's a really difficult system to use, people might just end up emailing all the files they need back and forth between each other. And that's, that's horrible, right? That's the worst thing for security because now they're going around the thing that's supposed to keep those files controlled and who can access them. As soon as people start just like ignoring that and emailing things to each other, then you know, that security system's failing. So ideally, it shouldn't be possible to um, not access things through our security system. Reference monitor is basically a concept that, that there is this thing that you use to access the files. So again, on Linux, it's the kernel. Every time you go to access a file, that request is via a system call. So a program says to the kernel, hey, give me this file. And the kernel says, uh, let me just check if that's OK. And then if it is OK, it gives the, um, basically gives access to that file, to that program. So every single access to a file goes via the kernel and a specific set of you know, the security subsystem within the kernel. So that's basically a reference monitor where you have something that mediates access to everything. The protection state, again, some more terminology, um, is like the, this complete state that the computer is in, in terms of you know, all of the um, processes and all the identity associated with them all. Security context is the identity or the information assigned to each subject that is used to inform the access decisions. So uh, if we were talking about this exact the analogy that I said had before of a you know standing at the door, I might say, you know check people's name badges, you know, is David allowed into this room? Is Chris allowed in the room? Umar, are you allowed in the room? Um, the security context in that situation is if I've checked your name badges already, the security context is the information written on your name badge. That's the information the person at the door is using to make that decision. So uh, on a Linux system, that's the UID and the GID and other security information that is associated with each of those processes. So you guys are processes on a computer, and you're trying to access something. I look at your name badge. What does your UID say? Is that user allowed to access it? Um, the thing, the stuff happens on a computer, though, where you might change your name badge. So you might maybe, I don't know, maybe Umar has permission to sometimes act on Taz's behalf, right? So, so you, Taz may have in the past said, yeah, I don't, it's fine. You can, you can, you can access that file for me or go, go into the room for me. Here, here's a name badge. And then, and, and it's a piece of paper that says you're allowed to use my name badge or something. And then you might put your put Taz's name badge over the top of your name badge, um, and in that situation, you've assumed that identity, and that's okay. But the act of doing that is a transition in the protection state of the system because things have now changed, and now you're acting with a different set of permissions. So it's really important on the computer system to clearly define what kinds of con security context changes are allowed. How are those um, transitions? You know, what are what are the, what are you allowed to do 
what, how are you allowed to change it? That needs to be really tightly controlled, obviously. And it might be that you need to actually go up to someone else and say, can you swap over my name badge? Uh, you know, you shouldn't just be able to randomly change your own name badge. Um, so again, that's an analogy for on a computer where you might um, change your UID so that you can do something that you're not normally allowed to do. So um, there are various ways you can do that on a, um, on a Unix system. Um, and that needs to be very tightly controlled. So an access control matrix is the simplest way of describing a uh, security state. And basically, it's just a massive table explaining every single access permission that is possible and whether it's allowed. So in this case, we have user A, user B, you know, a list of all the different, every single user is on this table. And every single resource that's on the computer or in the room or whatever is all uh, laid out in this tables. And then for each of these cells is whether or not that subject is allowed to access to that object and in what ways. Um, so in this example here, user A is allowed to read and write to file 1. And actually, that user owns that file. So they're allowed to change permissions and things for that file. Um, whereas user B is not allowed to read or write to the file, they're only allowed to append to the file. So they can just stick something at the end of it, they can't access what is inside the file or change what's inside the file, and, and so on. So this is an access control matrix. But this is basically an abstract way of thinking about things, because in reality, um, you would never use this system. Because just, you know, how many people you know, this table is just going to be massive once you've got 100 files, you know, and 10 users. It, it, it just becomes you know, unmanageable. So that's not the way that we um, store information about security, but it is one way of thinking about it. Um, so we actually need some kind of implementation to actually enforce this. And also you need to define what does this mean? What does reading mean? You know, what does writing mean and owning? What does own give you the ability to do? So... But the nice thing about an access control matrix, this big table, is you can use it to express any policy. You can, if you've got this massive table, if you can express anything this way. So, so I could say that you know, you three are allowed to access these files, and you guys are allowed to access this in these ways, and everything like that. Um, but yeah, it's mostly used for theoretical you know, analysis and things. So it's not actually used in real life. But we will come back to that in order to explain you know, different types of security systems. So a policy um, defines what's allowed. So that can either be formally or informally. So a formal policy might literally be you know, like this. The, this is what these users are exactly allowed to do. An informal policy might be more like in a business context, the sorts of things that you're supposed to do and, and um, you know, not, not specifically specified. If it's just written in English, it can be, you know, a bit ambiguous. Um, but a security policy basically defines what's secure um, and what what are the rules that we're trying to enforce. So if this is our policy, this uh, access control matrix here, if user B finds a way to write to file one, they've managed to subvert our security system and we're in an insecure state. That's really we don't we never want user B to be able to, um, you know, write to file one. If they figure out a way, then things are horribly broken. Um, and the way that we define what our policy is is going to be in terms of like confidentiality, in integrity, and availability. So again, thinking about those basic concepts in security, um, you know, are, do we want people to be able to read certain information? We are they allowed to change it? And you know, is it available to them? Basically, um, can you guys think of? practical examples of a security policy. Just anything, just to, you know, we all know what the terms mean. Yeah. So for example, like, if there's, um, but there are lots of information is available to people, mm -hmm. you're in an organization. Yeah. Yeah, so you will, um, often organizations will say whether certain resources are supposed to be publicly available. And a lot of time there's a lot of information that shouldn't be available to the public. And I don't know, can you think of an example of when information that we wouldn't want to share? Um, 
That's a reason, but yeah, finances. Finance is a good answer. Sorry. Company policies. Company policies. Yeah, so, you know some of that stuff you don't really want everyone to see. Um, so yeah, there's all sorts of reasons why you don't want stuff to be available. And th in that case, um, are we talking about confidentiality, integrity, or availability? Yeah. So it's about what someone has, you know, the ability to read. So that's confidentiality. If we're talking about whether someone can change something, we're talking about integrity, and whether it's something that's available is availability. Um, yeah, okay. So, you know, as, as we've discussed, a mechanism is something that enforces a policy. Um, so, for example, a firewall is a mechanism, right? It's a thing that does something. A model is a way of representing a policy or types of policies. Um, so we're starting to get a bit abstract. So a way of representing the kinds of rules. So for example, the um, you know this access control matrix. That's like a security model. Um, and again, we are. I'm introducing quite a lot of terminology, but this is really important, especially if you end up working on the defensive side of security. You know, or any type of security, it is important to understand this stuff. So, okay, I just said all this. So confidentiality deals with. Uh, sorry, confidentiality policy deals o only with confidentiality. So there are types of security systems that the military use, for example, where the most important thing to them is that things stay, remain confident, confidential. So there are security systems they have that will basically won't stop someone from altering information as long as they can't see the stuff they're not allowed to see. Like, that's like the most important thing to them. An integrity policy deals only with integrity. They're really, it doesn't matter what people can see, but it's super important that no one can alter this information. That's like the most important goal for us. And that is often the case in like a commercial setting. Um, but in reality, as like you can probably guess when I'm saying this, most people want a bit of confidentiality and integrity. So we have like a mixed model. Um, so real life policies do a bit of both. Um, you know, but there usually is an emphasis on one or another. So some types of access control, so these are access control models. Uh, there's non-discretionary access control, which is also known as mandatory access control, and there's discretionary access control. Those are the two big ones. So I'm going to talk about those. So non-discretionary access control or mandatory access control, um, it's one of those areas where the people don't agree with the terminology that you should be using. Basically, mandatory access control is when a, a system um, administrator or a security administrator gets to configure the security role, uh, rules, and that applies to everyone. So if I, for example, had this list of who's allowed, uh, no, hang on, let's, let's adjust the analogy so it works better. Um, say we've got a room and uh, oh, this analogy is really boring, got filing cabinets. And there's certain filing cabinets have different types of information in them. Um, so, for example, one might be for finances, one might be for um, use uh, personnel information, right? And all of you guys have name badges and you're allowed in the room. But someone's standing next to these two filing cabinets and just checking that you're allowed to access that filing cabinet. It's, a, it's not a very good analogy, but we'll, we'll go with it. Um, so it's, a, it's almost not even an analogy. It's like, what's happening on a computer. So, okay, so that's what's happening. Um, if I get to write all the rules about that information, then we've got a mandatory access control system. So you guys have no say over what you're allowed to access because I've labeled all of the files in these and filing cabinets with information that says, this file is about personnel information. This file is about... Um, you know, all the everything in this folder is about finances. And then I've written on your name tags, you know, your name, and then on my little piece of paper that no one, none of you get to touch, it says list of names and ho and whether or not you're allowed to access certain things, right? That's mandatory access control. You've got no choice. You can't change any of the security policies. You are subject to them, uh, and you have to basically, uh, you've got no ownership over any of those files either. You just have access to them and um, the rules specify what you're allowed to do. So that is mandatory access control.
So it works well when the organization owns all of the data. So all the information is owned by the organization. And I want to keep like tight control over what you're allowed to do. So for example, in the military or government, that's often the case. So I, I really know that you're only supposed to access certain stuff. Um, and it can prevent the problem where you guys, if you were allowed to change who's allowed to access what, and you made a mistake, you might accidentally end up doing something that you don't mean to do. So that stops you from making mistakes. Uh, and it's really predictable for me, being the person that's in control of all these files and, and everything, I know what's going to happen. It's, it's quite straightforward. Um, usually the way that works on a computer is you, you literally attach a security context label to an object. So I attach some information to each individual file on the computer. Um, and also, I attach a separate label to every single running um, process or every user on a system. And then there are rules that say what's allowed to happen. So it's literally exact. And the analogy is not too bad. So in, in this example, if I had certain um, printouts and I put a sticky note on it that said, you know, is this a per is is this specific file a um, you know personnel information or finance information? And then I look up on my name and I look, you know, is Chris allowed to access finances? Uh, I, I say yes. So yeah, okay. So you you can access it. That's what happens on a computer basically. Um, so, uh, so yeah, there's rules that define what's allowed to happen. Um, some ways of modeling traditional mandatory access controls is using like formal math. So there's like actual like a notation that describes exactly how this model works. Um, and the seminal models are very important um, traditional like papers and um, models that have been proposed, uh, such as Bell and Lepadula model, which is focused entirely on confidentiality, and the Bible model, which is um, entirely about strong integrity. Um, but uh, it's starting to become the case where there are certain ability, there is a, there are some security features in things, you know, consumer operating systems like Windows and Linux, where we can do things like this where we can define security rules that the users have no say over. So for example, on Linux, we can use SE Linux and AppArmor, and that's stuff that we'll look at in the next topic in the module um, when we start looking at virtualization sandboxing and things. Um, but for the most part, systems aren't based on what we've just described. Right? What I've just described is not the way that most Windows and Linux systems work. So the way that they work is via discretionary access control, which is where users own the files and get to choose who can access them, basically. So in this previous thing where I'm standing in front of the um, set of all, all of these um, files and checking against my set of rules, um, that's not exactly how it works. I guess my, uh, in altering my analogy slightly, say we've got a um, each user has their own um, folder with their own files in it um, and you get to say who's allowed to access them. So in this situation there might be a, um, a list on the front of, of a particular printout where you get to say who's allowed to access this file and I might still be standing in front of the, um, the filing cabinets just to check that you're all behaving it yourselves. But now you guys get to define what the policy is. So um, Chris you might have uh, you know, a certain file that you want to share with David. So you might change the rules for that file and say, David's allowed to access this file. And obviously, I'm standing there and check that you're, only you get to write on the front, say who's allowed to access it. But now, um, you know, it still might be that, that Stig can't, can't come along and access that file. Sorry. Um, because his name's not on the list of who's allowed to access it, but if David comes along, it's like, yeah, I, I know that Chris said that you're allowed to access the file. Chris owns the file. And maybe you're even allowed to say, I'm going to give away ownership of this file to someone else, and then you're not allowed to change those rules anymore, and the file is now owned by someone else. Yeah? What if it works like, uh, like Google Drive works? Where you can share a file, except... Um, yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
So you, you get to specify who's allowed to access the file. Um, yeah, so like Google Drive, that is, that is a form of access controls. So there's a list of people and what they're allowed to do on that, on that file. Um, and I don't think on Google Drive, though, you can give away ownership of a file, well, as far as I'm aware. They can give full edit. I don't know people yeah. Yeah. So on, on like a Windows system or a Linux system, you can give the file away entirely if you want. So you can say, uh, yeah, you own this file now. And then um, you've got no longer have any control over the permissions on it. Um, but yeah, so there are um, ways of a user controlling um, their own files, basically. And you can basically specify what other people are allowed to do. But as you can imagine, it's a little bit chaotic, right? So all the, there's so many interactions and ways that permissions can change. So if you are an organization like the military, that's not going to suit your needs very well, is it? But for real everyday life, it works quite well. I mean, it's, we get by with it on, on Linux and Windows. Um, you know, we've got by on that system for a really long time. It, I mean, it works. Um, so that's that's what we're used to using. Uh, if you're using older version of Windows, like Windows Millennium Edition, if anyone here can remember that, and earlier, so like you know, talking about like Windows 98, Windows 95, uh, <laughs> Windows 3.11, <coughs> there was no access controls at all. There was literally nothing in place to stop you from accessing each other's files. It was just free for all, in all senses of of the word. There was there was no controls there at all. Um, it was only in Windows NT, the server systems, where they actually had some form of security actually there for access controls. And Windows XP provides discretionary access controls, but almost everyone runs as administrator on Windows XP for practical reasons. Because if you don't run as administrator, all your programs complain and crash. Um, but um, you know, since Windows Vista, there is actually user access control uh, is available in Windows. And um, it, it now, you're, if you're using Windows, it's good because you can run as not an administrator. Just a phone call from Australia. Um, so, um, yeah, so now you can actually have a um, Windows system where you run and, you, you know, it's not possible, you know, hopefully it makes it harder to just accidentally screw up your whole system or for a security problem to cause a huge, huge impact. Um, but that's something we can talk about again later. Unix has had discretionary access control since the 1970s. So all along, they've been security in place on a Unix system. So um, the way that discretionary access control usually works is the processes are treated um, based on user identity. So you know, I was talking about name badges. You know, we've said this before. Hopefully, you got. Hopefully, you're sick of hearing me say it. That the processes on a Windows and a Linux system is most of the security decision is based on who started that program. So what is the user identity associated with that program? Um, in practice, what that means is that. Um, Programs can influence security configuration. So, um, you know, a user, uh, a program can then set permissions on your own files and things like that because the pro program is running with your permission on that system. And we're going to come back to program security throughout the module, really. Um, so, another kind of access control, in addition to role based uh, discretion access control and mandatory access control. One of the main models used to describe access control is role-based access control. And that's um, usually you'd use for non-discretionary non, um, access control, so kind of a mandatory control, usually. But basically, the, the idea is that if we've got an organization, everyone who has certain roles within the organization should be allowed to do certain things. Um, and this is slightly different from groups, um, but it's a similar concept. Um, but if we have a, um, I don't know, say a bank, we might have a manager role. And people who are manager, managers in the bank get to access certain information that everyone else can't access. 
but rather than having to manually give that person all of those permissions, we just have a role that they're allowed to assume at certain times. And maybe the same person has multiple roles that they can activate at various points. So rather than just giving that person always access to everything because they're a manager, they might also have the role of being an employee, which gives them a basic amount of access. And then every now and then they can escalate to being a manager and then they get these extra permissions. So that's what role-based access control is. <coughs> so I said we were going to come back to that um, access control matrix, and this is where I will. So an access control list is the most common way of describing permissions on a computer system. So an access control list, or an ACL, is um, attached to each object, um, and it describes the subjects that are allowed access. So, um, so it's like this. So you can see this diagram here. This is the original diagram we had. But now attached to each file is a list of all the permissions for all the users on that system. Um, so it basically stores all the rules for that specific file attached to each file. So that's the way that um, Windows and Linux works. So And in slightly different ways, but similar. So on Windows, they have a full access control list associated with every single file on the system. If you go into security properties for that file, you can see the list of all of the users and um, that are allowed to access that file. Uh, on Linux, it's a slightly um, simplified version of that, where you, it, it simplifies the permissions down to the owner of the file, everyone in um, a specific group that the file has associated with it, and everyone else on the entire system. So rather than a list of every single independent user on the system, it kind of groups people together into these categories. And that's the, the typical Unix way of doing things. Um, but it, you know, it's not. Linux has lots of extra security features in addition to that basic way of doing things, the Unix way. And we'll come back to that. So basically, the idea is with an ACL, the rules are stored with the object. So that's important. Capabilities, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Um, with uh, NCL, though, mm -hmm. actually, especially in Windows, if you try to edit a file, it says access denied because of the NCL. Yeah. And you actually change it saying you can actually write, but you can actually append the file. Uh -huh. You can say, right, I'm on this stream, I'm allowed to write to it. You know, when you change it, sometimes it still denies you access to it. Um, Why? It should not, well, no, if you change the permissions, in theory, and I'm not advocating the fact that Windows does security perfectly, but if it's working properly, it well, there might be multiple layers of security things going on. But just looking at that one specific layer of right, the, the ACLs, because Windows uh, inherits permissions from folders and things like that above it. But, but generally, the permissions on an in individual file should specify who can access that file. and. If you own that file, you can change those permissions. If you don't, you need to be an administrator or the person who owns that file to change those permissions. But you can, um, yeah, it, it should work as it's supposed to. So you can say, if you're not allowed access to it, if you're actually using your computer correctly and you've got multiple users sharing that computer, they should have independent user accounts. And then if you've got certain files that you want everyone to be able to use on that computer, you would set the permissions so that everyone's allowed to access it, or certain users are allowed to access it. Um, it's not good practice to have a shared computer with everyone using one account. Um, it's just it's good to have separate accounts for everyone, even just so that they don't set, uh, you don't have to look at desktop backgrounds that you don't like. <laughs> you know, um, but you know, from a security perspective, you, you should be using it correctly. Um, does that answer your question? Sort of. Yeah. So I'm not into the files and stuff like that. Yeah. Okay, that's fine. Uh, so capabilities is an alternative approach. So instead of attaching all of the information about who's allowed to do what to the to the objects, we instead attach that information to the subject. So basically, we keep the rules with the processes. So if, for example, um, going, going back to our not that inventive analogy of having physical files with things attached to them, if I had a printout of something 
and I stapled to it a list of all the users that are allowed to read that file, that's an access control list. If instead I give you on your name badge a thing that you can click onto it that has a list of files you're allowed to access, we're now talking about capabilities. So uh, it's information that's kept with the with the, the actual subjects of the system. And obviously you need a way of obtaining ca the actual capabilities, um, but there's there will be some mechanism for you to get proof, a token that says you're allowed to access something, and then when you go to access it, you'll, you'll be allowed uh, to access it. So that's what a capability is. What I was uh, going to say is with, with jobs. Mm -hmm. um, is it okay to, from a security perspective, um, to run as an administrator if there's only one account, or should you have an administrator account and then use a local? You should never, ever, ever run as an administrator. You should not log in as an administrator or a root user ever because it's too easy to, well, I could list how many reasons do you want. I'll give you two main ones. Is that you can make mistakes that are fatal. Well, hopefully not physically fatal, but you know, you can make, you accidentally type in a command and you've just wiped the entire computer. Like you've so deleted the operating system. Control, though, because it, I don't think Windows will let you do that unless you actually run it. Well, there's been various problems with that on, on Windows as well. But it, but yeah, that's still at least that's a level where you actually need to authenticate. Like on a, on a Linux or a Unix system, you should be logged in not as root, and then you should have to elevate your privileges to do the things that are important. So you type the root password to prove that you're allowed to do certain things. Or if it's an Ubuntu system, you um, have the permission to basically use your own password to do root things, which is similar to a Windows like user account control, where, where you can like specifically escalate to do certain things. So the Windows security system tries to have that balance where you might be an administrator, but you can't just delete things without clicking something on the screen. But there have been various problems with that mechanism in the past. So it's not it's not perfect, but it's better than nothing. Um, so if we're talking about capabilities versus ACLs, capabilities require applications to be aware of them. And they're, they can, well, they're considered to be hard to manage, uh, although some people in the security committee will strongly argue the opposite. But access control lists uh, are just easy in general because we just store them with the files. So it's, it's very straightforward, basically. Um, and they're stored within the file system. Uh, and that's the way that most operating, operating systems do things. Um, so on Windows and Unix, which includes Linux and Mac, um, we use ACLs for discretionary access control, although there are other security features that we will talk about um, in the next couple of weeks. So that's where I'm going to um, cover for now in today's lecture, and then next week we pick, pick this up and talk about some specifics to do um, mostly with like Unix uh, as the example where we look at the way that the um, file permissions and access controls and things work. So the takeaway messages from the lecture is the fact that we use access control to mediate actions based on what a subject's allowed to do, and there's a policy that defines what you're allowed, what different people are allowed to do, so what you're authorized to do. Um, and there are things that we're going to cover next week about the quite powerful and expressive ways that we can do that in Linux. Um, so yeah, so we're going to continue on with this topic next week and go into some more detail. Uh, that's all I'm going to cover this week.